So I'm going to get out of the way and bring this guy up. Um, we could not be happier with what we ended up with, and I'm going to make him blush a little bit. Um, the guys at Wild Seed said they, 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 they envisioned the people that they need to find. They envisioned someone who knew the industry in Canada really well and would maybe be able to do this, and they found me. They envisioned their ideal creator, and it was uh, someone a couple years out of school who maybe isn't too jaded yet, um, <laughs> but has had a couple years under their belt to see the limitations of what happens, and you can kind of fall into the job and disappear into it, and, but still has those dreams of making something. Um, we found exactly who we were looking for. And, uh, and, and really, like it was, he was a standout last year. There was some stiff competition, but he was a standout. And uh, we could not be happier to be doing this with, you, with him now. Um, so on that note, I'm going to get out of the way and let Andy come up here, and he can talk to you about you know, the real stuff, about making his show. Thanks, guys. throw some thanks out. Thanks to Startune and Animatic TO for organizing this. Uh, thanks to Gamespace for hosting it. And uh, my parents are actually out in the audience and I just wanted to do a shout out. Thank you to them for being my support system. So yeah, you guys want to learn about cartoons, I guess, or something? <laughs> cool. So I guess um, the best place to start is a bit about myself. So I started animation in school, like a lot of people here probably. I started animation at Sheridan in 2010. And uh, right from the beginning, I had an interest in kind of series development and stuff like that. A lot of stuff that informed my opinions about cartoons were from shows that were creator driven. I didn't know it at the time, but they were all, you know, those kinds of shows, stuff like Dexter's Lab or Samurai Jack, Powerpuff Girls. All of them had a really strong impression and footprint of that creator in it. Um, and again, it wasn't something I did consciously. It was something that I just thought it was better than a lot of some of the other shows that I was watching. And so um, with that in the back of my mind, I, I, did, I went to Sheridan. Um, and in 2013, I did an internship in Los Angeles at a studio called Six Point Harness. And it was during my time out there that I really got to kind of see a real pipeline about how things are developed and how things work. Do we have anyone in the audience who also interned at Six Point Harness? I thought I saw you coming in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and it was a really great experience. And it was during that time that I started to think about my career and what I wanted to do in the future. And up until then, it was a lot of, hey, you know, maybe I'll, I'll do character design or maybe some storyboards. And then, but after that summer, it was pretty much me set on, I want to be a showrunner. I want to be like these guys that I see getting interviewed and making their content and entertaining people. And um, that was always um, something in the back of my mind as well, is I wanted to make content and I wanted to entertain people. I wanted to make them laugh. I wanted to make them feel something with stuff that I made. Um, so when it came to fourth year uh, and at Sheridan, and if there's any Sheridan people out in the crowd, you know that that is when uh, we make our fourth year films, which is a crazy process. Um, and so I went down the route that I saw a lot of other creators that I was inspired by doing, which was I kind of made my film around the idea that I wanted to do something with these characters in the future. I wanted to develop them. I don't know necessarily if those creators I mentioned had that in mind when they did their films, but that was kind of the model I was going after. So um, uh, with that in mind, I started thinking about, well, what's the kind of show that I want to make? Um, and what's the kind of stuff that I like? And I thought, well, I really like the paranormal. I really like ghost stories. I really like um, you know things that you would tell around a campfire. Um, there's this weird Christmas tradition where people tell ghost stories, apparently. I never really got that, but it's cool. <laughs> and so I wanted to kind of tap into that, um, you know, ghost stories and stuff like cryptozoology, studying Bigfoot and stuff like that. I thought that stuff was just, that's super interesting to me. And I was like, all right, I'm going to make something like that. I'm going to make something connected to that and related to that in some capacity. And so um, I had a kind of an idea in my mind, but then I was like, the characters need to be integral to this process and the characters need to be kind of the center stage because that's what the audience is going to connect with. And so I started thinking, well, all right, wh who, who are these guys going to be? And I came up with um, 
I came up with two guys named uh, Haywood, and I came up with another guy named Bentley. And these are kind of their, uh, their ugly preteen designs. Um, <laughs> you know, everyone has an awkward stage. And um, so I went through the process, and I thought, um, I thought about, well, OK, I'm going to put them in a situation where they have to deal with paranormal things. And then I started to think, uh, well, what kind of, what could I do that not only puts them in proximity to one another, but in addition uh, puts them in proximity to the paranormal? And I started coming up with, you know, maybe their junk removal services, where they kind of, you know, you know they call them, it's like, hey, I got a ghost. And then they show up and they, with like a dolly and they cart him away or something like that. And then I started thinking, well, Grim Repo, with the Grim Reaper, and I was like, oh, that's real clever. <laughs> <laughs> and so I ran with that, and they became Grim Repo Paranormal Repossession Services. And I embarked on this crazy journey. Um, my film was really long, pretty overcooked. You know, the voice acting was not great. Um, it was just me recording with my iPhone speakers in like the like laundry, it was not a laundry room, the studio has a laundry room, <laughs> in, the school, in the school pitching room. And um, yeah, I have that here. It's a bit of an eyesore for me to watch now, but I'm gonna play it for you guys just to see where things kind of all started. Yeah. Yes, we're here. Oh, what is that smell? My lunch. It's a burrito. <laughs> Just throw it away. Heavy. Welcome. Insert coin for magic show. It's evil. Cool. Insert. Bentley, insert. don't insert. Insert. touch it. It doesn't even work. You have awakened Candy Freak Gap, King of Cavity. Behold my demonic power. Listen to me. <laughs> Just throw it away. What sorcery is this? We have each other. Crap! What do we do now? I got an idea. He looks so natural. That'll do, fish. That'll do. You owe me a burrito.
大佬，準備好晒啦，可以開門啦。Yeah, so that happened. <laughs>、uh, Yeah, so that that uh that was my fourth year film coming out of Sheridan.、Um, it was a hot mess, <laughs> and、uh, after coming out of it, I was kind of like, "Ooh, this is a bit of a controlled disaster." I thought, anyways. A lot of people liked it, which I was very grateful. I had some really kind things to say, but I knew deep down that it was not quite the vision I had in mind. Um, and there was some interest in developing it at that time.、Um, there were some individuals who came to me at Industry Day and said, "You know, what if we were to take this and you know develop a show with it?" And I made the decision to say no. And I felt that not only was the concept not ready to be developed further, but I, as an artist,、uh, was not prepared to undertake that. I wanted to get some experience under my belt before I started getting into development. And so、uh, after graduation, I moved out to Vancouver and got a job at a little studio called Titmouse. And、uh, while I was out there, I worked on a couple productions, and it really kind of、um, showed me a better.、Uh, I had seen the pipeline experience during my internship, but this was now one where I was integral to the part to the pipeline experience.、Um, and I got comfy at that job. Uh, the first production I was on was a really, really comfortable job, and I really enjoyed it. It was animating on a show. It wasn't a demanding job, but it paid enough that I could live,、uh, I, I could live comfortably. <laughs> and so、um, that was that was a good experience for me. And again,、uh, the thought of pitching kind of faded into the background for me, and I just kind of became this autonom autonomous machine, and I would, you know, insert coin and I would animate. Kind of thing,、um, and that all came to a screeching halt、uh, when I started on my second contract at that studio, and it was a project I did not enjoy at all, and、uh, I was suffering hard for it. <laughs> and but、um, the upside to working on a production that I did not enjoy was that it kind of shocked me back into, well, wait a minute, I was interested in pitching and developing and eventually show running, so that's what I want to take my focus and turn to.、Um, So,、um, as some of you may know,、uh, for pretty much mostly all of you who have worked in an animation studio before,、uh, act, uh, show of hands, who, who's working in the animation industry right now? And、uh, students in the animation industry, recent grads or otherwise? Okay, cool. Well,、um, uh, that was just for my aid, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So studios,、um, as some of you some of you may know or may not know,、um, usually allow for pitches to be、um, pitched to them. They usually have a department that handles that and develops IPs and stuff like that.、Um, however, that can be a very slow process. And while I was out in Vancouver, Titmouse does have a development program. You can pitch to producers out there in Titmouse, and、um, they have three locations. Most of the nitty-gritty pitching gets done in their LA and New York location, but Vancouver is kind of、uh, on the up and go still. So it, it's allowed, but it's not quite as、um, it's not quite as comprehensive as it is out in Los Angeles or New York. Not that that's an excuse for me not pitching to them.、Um, I started developing a couple ideas, and I started thinking, you know, like, oh, I'm gonna make this. It's about, you know, sword and spells and like high fantasy stuff. It's gonna be like Dark Crystal. It's gonna be so good.、Um, <laughs> and I got,、uh, I got far into it. You know, I started designing characters. I started coming up with a premise for it,、um, and eventually, it just kind of petered out for one reason or another.、Um, and again, it, it, my focus just shifted towards. Oh my God! I don't like this job. I have to do something creative, or else I'm going to go crazy. And so,、um, after trying to start a couple of films independently on my own,、um, a couple people came to me and shared something called Startoon.、Um, one of those people being Noam Sussman. <laughs> Maybe at your request, I don't know. Without <laughs> 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 reach. <Yeah. laughs>、um, but I took a look at.、Um, 
I took a look at starting and I was a bit cautious because um, th there's no beating around the bush that it was a contest. And contests that require you to draw for them can be a little sketchy, um, to say the least. <laughs> so I started to take a look at it and um, see what it was all about. Um, and I went to, um, I started thinking about Canadian content in particular, and importantly, how Canadian content, or Canadian original content compares to stuff coming out of Japan or coming out of Europe or Fran Europe, uh, France is in Europe. Um, uh, <laughs> coming out of Japan or Europe or uh, our neighbors to the south in Burbank at Los Angeles. And there is a distinct lack of something. Um, it was frustrating because a lot of shows in Canada don't quite have that appeal or that reach that shows coming out of Los Angeles, for example, have. It lacks that certain the soul almost, you know? And um, it, a lot of the shows that I saw, and I'm not going to name any in particular, um, uh, they just felt kind of cheap and mediocre in comparison, you know? And um, they really didn't have a name for themselves beyond Canadian borders. So if you didn't watch, like, you know, if you weren't there for that specific time slot on Teletoon, you have no idea what it is or you've never heard of it before. And it just kind of like the, the content, it lost its focus, much like I'm starting to do right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I found a lot of Canadian content uh, kind of talks down to kids. Um, not in a way that it calls them, you know, dumb or anything like that, but in a way that it was kind of almost patronizing the stuff that they talk about. It was like, woohoo, farts, and that was, you know, that was it. And there was, you know, I, if I'm sitting down to watch something, I want to, you know, I want some drama, you know, where, where are the stakes? <laughs> it's <a> joke. <laughs> But it, it, it kind of patronized them instead of engaging them. Um, and so um, I, it was, you know, um, they were a little overly absurd and there was no heart, just kind of a speedometer which with how many jokes or how many fart jokes can we cram into 11 minutes or 22 minutes in this time slot. And um, it felt more like they were just filling up a time, spot, a time slot with content rather than engaging uh, the audience and telling them a story with fun characters, which I think is key to developing um, a successful television program. Yeah. I don't know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, with, all, with all this in mind, I talked to Mike and I reached out to him and um, I've I figured this was kind of, uh, the more I talked to him, the more I started to realize that he was on the same page with me and that more importantly, the StarTune initiative as a whole knew exactly what I was talking about and wanted to kind of rectify that in the animation industry. It wanted to see more character-driven content. It wanted to see creator-driven content. And so um, this was kind of my call to adventure, you know? And this was the opportunity. Um, at that point, I was kind of like, I have to make my own opportunity. Opportunities aren't going to just fall in my lap, and an opportunity fell in my lap immediately. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. So it was great that Mike agreed with my thoughts on Canadian content, perhaps not verbatim, but in a general sense. Um, and we both had high hopes that we would um, go into this and this initiative overall, not just for myself, but in general, would kind of get artists to tap into those creative ideas that they have and to put them out there and get them in front of the right people. Um, so now at that point, I was like, okay, well, I'll do StarTune. And I was at that scary fork in the road where I had to come up with a pitch. <laughs> and I was like, Ugh, what am I going to do? And then I was thinking, well, I don't want to do that one that I had for Tim Mouse because that one I'm like, I'm way too attached to it. It's going to be so good. Dark Crystal, <laughs> Jim Henson, you know. <laughs> Can I have the Goblin King from Labyrinth? And, and yeah. <laughs> so um, I had to think about um, what I wanted to pitch. And then that brought me back to the idea that I had during school with Grim Repo and Bentley and Haywood. And I retooled it, I redesigned them, I rebuilt the thing from the ground up, and I repackaged them as Grim Repo with Sonny and Bentley. Um, 
fortunately, Haywood uh, wasn't that developed in the student film, if at all. He's kind of a stick bug that like <laughs> reacted to Bentley doing things. So that gave me um, an opportunity to, to rebuild him completely and retool him as a scared monkey. Um, and so, ironically, when I went into this uh, procedure with this and redeveloping them, I thought I would do Grim Reaper because I thought it was an expendable idea. I thought it was like, oh, it's a, it's a poo idea. There's nothing's going to come out of it. Um, <laughs> so I thought it was safe to kind of, you know, knock around and, and see what happens. Little did I know what would happen. Um, so. <laughs> As I developed it more, I started to fall in love with the idea again. I started to realize, oh yeah, I really do love you know ghost hunting and, and Sasquatch and chupacabras and you know all that great stuff. Um, maybe even fit in some dark crystal down the road. <laughs> and so um, yeah, I, I've always been intrigued by the paranormal, and um, that came back full force this time around. And I thought you know what, this is kind of, this is a really good opportunity to step out of the kind of absurd comedy range and develop something that is more a comedy horror, which is something I would love to do and something that I am fortunately doing now. Um, and so I didn't want to make it overly safe like a lot of original Canadian content tends to be. So I want it to be a little bit more mature but not inappropriate. And so um, uh, there wasn't, I didn't want it to have a lot of hand holding. I didn't want it to be safe. And I wanted it to be more like the audience was embarking on adventures with Sonny and Bentley rather than kind of, you know, what are these two crazy guys gonna do today? And, uh, <laughs> and yeah. So, um, with that being said, I started the uh, challenges. And um, maintaining a quality throughout was important for me because I wanted to show the judges at Startune and the producers at Wild Seed that I was really serious about this. This was kind of, you know, my magnum opus. It was, uh, I, I wanted it to be really good. I wanted it to be really polished. I wanted it to look professional. I wanted them to think, wow, this is a show already, because that just makes it so much easier to develop it further with me in the driver's seat. Um, which, again, is what they wanted from the beginning. So, you know, I'm here scheming, and they're like, we want to do that to begin with. Like, <laughs> you don't have to be sneaky. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, uh, there, there was important, it was important that I wanted, and I wanted to show off that, uh, one, I was dedicated to maintaining the quality of the shorts, and two, that I wanted, um, that my confidence in the idea was so strong and I believed in it so much that they started to believe in it as well. And uh, yeah, why don't we throw it over to one of the challenge videos. Has anyone actually seen any of the challenge videos I've submitted? Yeah. yeah. Do we have any favorites? <laughs> Dim sum. Dim sum? Yeah, all right. <laughs> this is my favorite too. <laughs> Mmm, that was delicious. Sonny, did you enjoy your dim sum? Uh, they didn't bring out one of my dumplings, but that's okay, because I'm stuffed. Why don't you just eat this one? I found it on the ground. Open up for the airplane. <laughs> choo -choo -choo. Stop. No, gross. You're gonna give me a bimble. More pee for your... Yeah. It's okay. I don't think he saw us. Uh, sorry about that. He was trying to make me eat a dumpling, but I didn't want to eat the dumpling. I didn't want to get a pimple either. And then he, he hit a bunch of stuff, and then he hit you in the face by accident, and I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, hello, young lady. Why don't we, uh, yeah, how about, uh, okay, yeah, ah. Uh, ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> Um, yeah. 
so yeah, that was one of the challenges. And um, on a side note, one of the big challenges throughout the whole process was thinking, I have to do all this by myself. So I have to be able to be my layout artist, my character designer, um, my compositor, and my voice actor. Um, so that, that was a good, you know, week and a half of me in my bathroom by myself making voices to myself. Um, the neighbors complained. Um, but it was great because by the end of it, they had a character who sounded completely different from the other one. Um, yeah, and I picked up some, some nifty voice acting tricks along the way, so it doesn't hurt to have that in the back pocket. Um, but yeah, so that, that was really important to me, is, was maintaining a quality of entertainment and professionalism throughout the challenge. Um, again, I, I was a bit of a keener, and I wanted to, to show off um, how dedicated I was to the idea and to the initiative of StarTune. And that, like, that was kind of, that was kind of my, my, my thing, I guess. Um, your jam. That, that was my jam, yeah, you know, that was my mixtape. <laughs> Um, and uh, what, what worked out wonderfully was by the end of it, I won. <laughs> and that was great. Um, a few of you might have seen me on the, the live feed, all kind of, you know, disheveled with my, uh, my anime sweater <laughs> over in Vancouver. I was drinking, it was a red party cup, but I was drinking water. It was like nine in the morning, so it's not crazy. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, um, do you guys want to see the final challenge that I submitted? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you guys. <laughs> Can you give us a little more background what the challenge was? Like? Yes. Okay. So, uh, pardon me. Um, <laughs> so, throughout the process, um, there were four challenges, I believe. Um, five if you include the audition video. And actually, that's a Great point, I should probably show the audition video. So when, <laughs> when I went into this competition, um, I, like I said, I, I redesigned everything, I redetailed everything, I rewrote the characters, I, re I think I ever said redesigned already. Um, <laughs> and I built them from the ground up. And at this point, I had about a week left in the competition. So I was like, oh my god, there's so much work to do. And so I spent a good sleepless night, or sleepless night, sleepless week, um, balancing a full-time job and um, making these videos. And I came up with an audition video, which was basically a glorified walk cycle, if you pay really close attention to it. <laughs> um. the first kind of challenge for me was um, how do I, in this limited amount of time I have, retool my entire fourth year film into a sellable product. Um, and when I say sellable product, I mean have uh, the characters be interesting enough for the audience to care about them and be interested in them, and have the hook of the idea kind of well, I don't even think at that point it was really important to get the hook into the audience. I think it was important to just show a peek into the world that the characters live in so that it feels distinct and it has a charm to it. We always just said we did, the, the, the trick of the submissions was make us want to see more. Yes. It's, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's that simple. We yes. don't expect to see a whole thing. We want to ask you back. Yeah. It, it was all really much, it was pretty much how do I set up a really good tease, you know. How do I make them go, I want more, I want to see more. 
<laughs> and so um, after that, I embarked on a series of challenges. And the one after that, I believe, was the Q&A. Now, in, in the scope of the series and of the or in the scope of StarTune, sorry, and the challenges that it was asking me to do, I wanted to make sure that none of them kind of felt like, we asked you to do this, and here's my response to it kind of thing. I wanted it to feel natural to the world that they are in. So I kind of shaped the Q&A around something involving Sonny and Bentley, rather than um, a mysterious voice off screen just asking them questions. And so, uh, again, presentation was a big part on my mind when I was coming up with these things because, like Mike said, I wanted them to want more from it. I wanted them to see more, or to want to see more. And so that was part of, um, and that, was part of that jam. Uh, and this one was not at all sponsored by or affiliated with the New Zealand Department of Sanitation. <laughs> Hello boys, are you ready for your interview? Mm-hmm. Did you start your day with a good breakfast? Yep, I made my special breakfast. It's two pounds of chili, eight eggs, 42 pancakes, and a steamed trout. Sunny handsome too. Well, I'm glad to see that you're feeling better. Let's continue. Your best or worst childhood memory. The best is when I wrestled a kaiju and I got this. Uh, no, you got that running through poison oak. And then you hugged me and my face got all swollen. And I was in the hospital for a month. Okay. Yes, Sunny remembers it differently, but trust me, it was awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, next question, then. What is your greatest secret? I don't want to talk about it. He's afraid of this! It, is it gone? Uh, let's wrap this up, fellas. Where do you see yourselves in five years? Same thing I'm doing now. Out on the road with my best bud, Sonny, being the best repo man out there. I'd like a nice office job. <laughs> Thank you. So that was the first real challenge for me because I had to do a whole lot. I had to, one, make an interview interesting and engaging for an audience. Two, make the judges and the people watching it be like, oh my god, I want more. And three, uh, like I said before, come up with voices for these characters. And um, yeah, and that was the result. And it turned out pretty good. And it was also another one of my favorites, probably that. I'm just gonna say they're all my favorites, aren't I? <laughs> um, but yeah, that was that was the that was the first challenge. The second challenge was the breakfast one. I'm not gonna play that again. Um, but uh, with that one, it was kind of like, well, okay, how do I make breakfast interesting? How do I make it so that it again shows a peek into Sonny and Bentley's world and isn't, you know, them just sitting at a table. We are eating breakfast. We are having it. It is good. Mm -mm, you know. <laughs> Credits, like, so that that was a that was a challenge for me, and then I started thinking like, all right, well, where would Sonny and Bentley go for breakfast? What would Bentley do to Sonny that will gross him out and exacerbate the situation? And how are they going to get out of it? And what if they don't get out of it and something happens? Um, and that was that challenge, and um, it, it was one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, after that. Um, I believe it was the loop challenge, right? And so the loop challenge for me was um, a tricky one because um, it was supposed to be simple and of course I made it not simple. Um, and it was, uh, I don't think I was entirely successful with this one, but I still thought it was pretty funny. And um, I, think it, I think it worked out okay in the end. Nope. <laughs>
the theme was gone fishing. <laughs> uh, thank you. And so, uh, what, completing that final loop challenge, I think that earned me a place in the top three, correct? And um, mm -hmm. this is when it kind of got really serious for me because the final challenge was a challenge called Face Your Fears. And I believe the limitation was it has to be at least a minute. And um, of course, mine was much more than that. <laughs> um, <laughs> my goal with this one was to do my fourth year film over again, but better. <laughs> <laughs> And so that was kind of the criteria I had in mind. And at the same time, I believe one of the judges in the feedback video said um, she wanted to see like the setup for how things would play out in an episode. That was her feedback. And I sat down and I was like, well, great. She wants me to make a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I made a pilot. Um, <laughs> it was a long and bloody three weeks. Um, but I think the results were okay. There's a Lovecraft quote at the, at the front because I thought that'd be cool. I <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> There's tons of secrets in there, by the way, for all you, for all you Nancy Drews out there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that was the um, that was the the final challenge, and um, and it was pretty pretty fun. Um, I had a blast making it. Um, and again, um, like in fourth year, I came out of this thing thinking, if I win, it's going to be like, this is it. This is like, they're just going to be like, all right, let's make it. 52 episodes in a movie. Um, um, and of course, that was not the case. <laughs> so after winning, um, which was great, um, I um, immediately wrote a 30 page Bible for the <laughs> series and sent it to them, thinking they're going to be like, oh wow, he's already got this solid, give him money kind of thing and make it. Um, uh, of course, uh, that was all promptly thrown out and recycled into other ideas. And um, when we came to the decision, uh, okay, I should talk about um, that. When I won, it was very much a situation of, now the prize said it was going to be 25k to make a pilot but you kind of did that already for free. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> they presented me with uh, two options, uh, the red and blue pill. Uh, just kidding. Um, they presented me with two options. One was we would use the budget to make another short like I had done for the challenges. Um, and the other option was to make a pitch package. Um, and when I say pitch package, I mean a very, very com uh, comprehensive pitch package. So that would include stuff like um, two scripts, um, a good old-fashioned pitch bible with all the designs, episode ideas and outlines, characters, settings, locations, all that jazz. Um, in addition to that, um, a very, very completed lockdown animatic with full sound and voice acting and an animation test. And I saw those two options and I was like, well, I guess I'll pick that one, uh, which, which was the development process and the development plan, which I am incredibly grateful for the opportunity to do with Wild Seed Studios and has proven to be the right choice um, in the matter. So um, yeah, that was, that was the whole starting competition process and I guess now I'll I can, can I talk about, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about where things are going right now with Wild Seed. Or actually, does anyone have any questions about the starting competition and the scope of it all? I think go through the Wild Seed stuff and then bring it all to Okay, sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so, um, Wild Seed Studios is a production studio out in the UK. And um, they're the ones that are working with me to develop Sonny and Bentley into a fully fledged series. And I'm very grateful to be working with them. They're wonderful people. Um, shout out to Miles, Jesse, and Sarah. I don't know if they'll even see this video, but. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll give them yeah. time for you. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so throughout the process, um, I know there's a lot of hesitation because um, oftentimes when you pitch a series and you go to development with producers, there's a lot of the producers wanting to be very hands-on with it, wanting to change a whole bunch, and by the end of it, you know, it's not really your idea anymore. It's kind of been genetically altered into something else. And so um, I was very pleasantly surprised when instead of the producer saying, okay, this is what I think we should change, I was met by the producers going, okay, where do you think we can develop it more? And so it was, it's been a very uh, collaborative and symbiotic process with them. And none of the notes that they give me, and there are a tremendous amount of notes, um, are mandatory. And like Mike said earlier, a lot of it is just convincing them and explaining to them some ideas that maybe they don't quite understand in the current way that I'm wording them. Um, some fun facts uh, throughout this process, I learned that Ouija boards are a big no-no in <laughs> broadcast television. <laughs> so that last challenge would not fly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> exactly. What did they say? Um, they said there is always a workaround for things. So, you know, if maybe we can't have, you know, a Ouija board out of the Milton Bradley box, because it, it, 
I also found out it's a board game for children. There's also there's a lot of things like um, I wanted to use the term druid in a document, and they said, "Well, oh, no, we can't use that." And they explained it as druid is still a religion you can register as as on a census in the UK. Um, I certainly don't want to step on any toes, especially about people who possibly wield magic. <laughs> I've seen the dark crystal many, many times. Many times. Um, but yeah, it, it, um, at this stage, um, you know, I, I learned kind of what is tasteful to make jokes about, what isn't tasteful to make jokes about. Um, I, I'd like to think I had a pretty okay idea about it before, but now I'm, I'm working in the broadcasting kind of universe, so there's a whole lot of fine print to kind of comb through. And um, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of kind of paranormal stuff falls into there, but there is always, like um, the people in the UK have told me, there is always a workaround for ideas that m the network may say is, oh, that's, that's inappropriate. Um, there's always a workaround. Um, and to add on to that, I think J.G. Quintel, the creator of Regular Show, in a few interviews has said, you know, they'd be like, oh, you can only say idiot twice in an episode. And they would send them five suggestions way worse than that, and they'll pick one. So, it, it, you know, sometimes being denied your first choice leads to something much better. <laughs> um, but getting back to the development process with these guys, it's been really great. Um, we all kind of like the same stuff. They like Stranger Things. I like Stranger Things. You should all like Stranger Things. It's a fantastic series. Um, yeah, and um, in terms of the notes they've been giving me, it hasn't been so much of change this, fix that, change this person to be this instead. It's kind of been as if I'm walking down a very dark hallway and there are three very, very polite and very nice British people guiding me so that I don't trip and fall. <laughs> um, and so... Um, the British part just makes them seem nicer. Exactly, right? <laughs> you know, we share a queen, it's wonderful, it's this great relationship. <laughs> But uh, again, throughout the whole process, none of the notes they've given me are mandatory. And I think the only one that has really stuck out is in the scope of the series, um, the characters are a whole bunch of mix of animals and people and whatever Bentley is. Ooh, <laughs> feedback. Uh, whatever Bentley is. And, and you know, they were kind of thinking, well, if everything is kind of weird, doesn't that mean nothing is? And I was kind of like, well, that's, that's a good point. And so, they suggested, you know, maybe we change everyone so that they're human instead. And I was like, oh no, I was repulsed by the idea <laughs> for obvious reasons, <laughs> which are not obvious. But, uh, <laughs> but basically, uh, that was a note that I didn't really gel with, I didn't really like, and really it was just me better explaining to them um, what I wanted to accomplish by having these mix of characters. Um, point in case, the argument that I used was that it's for visual diversity and visual interest. Because it's much more interesting if you see, you know, a monkey and a fish man running around as opposed to a boy and a fish man running around. And not only that, but it also, if it's a boy and a fish man, it also kind of treads into that trope of, oh, it's a boy and his monster kind of story. And it's totally not. Um, but yeah, and that was really the only, the only real thing that um, was kind of a speed bump throughout this whole process was, you know, maybe they should be human or maybe they shouldn't all be animals or maybe they should all be animals and no humans. And um, if that was the case, we wouldn't have such a wonderful main cast. This is the reveal, by the way. This is the main cast of the, the series we're going with so far. It's going to be a blast. <laughs> Buy our merch in the back. <laughs> uh, just, there's no merchandise. Next year, next ne next year. <laughs> yes. We're going to have toys and everything. Um, <laughs> so this is, um, this is kind of what's come out of it, um, in addition to a whole bunch of animation stuff that I've been doing to keep my hands busy. Um, there is, it's much more comprehensive. Um, the characters have been, again, rebuilt from the ground because in the scope of the competition, how I, went atta at how I attacked it was, how do I crystallize these characters so that there is maximum amount of conflict between them? So in that case, it was Sunny is cowardly and Bentley is bold. And so it worked in the shorts, but in the scope of a full series, you have to make these characters much more three-dimensional to make them interesting. You have to give them, you have to give an audience a reason to connect with them. 
And so um, their characters have been retooled more or less. I mean, on the surface, you know, Sonny's still cowardly and Bentley's still bold, but there's, there's much more depth to them now. You know, there's, there's tragic backstories and, you know, <laughs> and all that. Tales of, of surgery gone awry and, and the likes. Um, and then it also gave me an opportunity to create um, some padding in the supporting cast. So now it's not just Sonny and Bentley. Now we have um, the beaver is named Daisy. Um, the purple girl is named Willow. The security guard is Grace Jones, not Grace Jones. It is, uh, <laughs> 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 it is a lovely security person named Dana Fox. And that man in the dolphin uniform is Bentley's adoptive father, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also Daisy's dog, um, who does not have a name. I think I'm leaning towards Bottle Rocket or BR for short. I think that's pretty neat. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the lineup we're working with now going forward so that it's not just Sonny and Bentley stories, but now we can have stories that involve Bentley and his dad, or Sonny and Daisy, or the dog and, and Sonny and Bentley, or something like that. So it allows for much more opportunities in storytelling and stuff like that. And um, moving forward without the input of Wild Seed, I'm not sure that we would have had that in the completed thing. So it's, it's again, it's been a very good process working with them and there's been a lot of good stuff to come out of it and um, yeah here's just a, a bit of a, a way of how the um, the designs have changed over time um, starting with the student film and then the challenges and then you know the various um, clone Sonny and Bentleys that <laughs> had various defects and uh, design <laughs> changes um, and what we've ended up now with the with the final series which I think is, is pretty nice um, yeah. Um, here's kind of a paranormal identification chart that I wrote to uh, better explain what I meant by uh, visual diversity. So it kind of shows you, you know, if they have two legs and they wear pants, they're people. Um, and that's kind, of, that's kind of the golden rule to go by. Um, and then there's stuff like ghosts, there's stuff like magic users, there's stuff like monsters and cryptids. That's a Mothman, by the way. Um, and there's that terrifying thing on the far end, which is a lot of what they're going to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with in the full series. Um, yeah. Some Star Trek PR stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's really crazy to see, you know, where things start and where they end up. This was more or less where I started with Sonny and Bentley, um, back then known as Haywood. Oh my God. Um, so they weren't always, you know, what they turned out to be in the fourth year film. They weren't always a monkey and a fish man. Bentley actually was probably always a fish man, actually. Um, yeah. So it, it's cool to see progression and, and how things evolve and change over time. Um, yeah. Um, so what I'm hoping for in the future, um, in moving forward with Sonny and Bentley and um, Grim Repo, which is the, the name that I'm kind of working with now, um, what I'm hoping is, is really to kind of uh, make a really great cartoon. I want to tell a really great story with some really fun characters. Um, and I think an important part in creating a character-driven show is finding that marriage and that alchemy between what makes a great character and what is compelling storytelling that is going to connect with an audience. And then once you have that foundation laid down, you can start adding things in, like you can start adding in jokes. You can start plotting out stories that you want to tell with it. And overall, I think it's going to be a much more engaging experience for an audience. And it's, um, again, it's something that you see being done out in LA and stuff being done in Japan and France. And it's stuff that I think um, we're kind of past due to get on board with. Um, so what I, what I hope to do with Sonny and Bentley is I'd love to tell an overarching story in the process of it so that there isn't a necessarily um, full reset by the end of each episode, which a lot of cartoons tend to do. Um, I want it to be episodic, but, or not, sorry, not episodic, I want it to be serialized, 
but in a way that you can watch them out of order and it's fine. But if you were to watch them in order, it's, such, it's so much more of a rewarding experience and you start to see things that are peppered in throughout the background. You start to see a story formulating in the background that nece isn't necessarily the focus of an episode. And that's been a, that's been a blast to, to wor work with um, the guys in Wild Seed with. And, um, you know, it's, it's all leading up to eventually, once we get the animatic done and once we have all our stuff lined up, it's all going to lead up to pitching it to broadcasters and networks. And then after that, you know, nine seasons in a movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe a trilogy. <laughs> I'd really like to work with Idris Elba, you know? Like, I, I think he's, I think he's he, he'd be a good sonny. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, that, that's kind of, um, I'd want it to be kind of the equivalent of, do we have anyone who read Lord of the Rings as a kid? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> you know, or, or something equally as daring and, you know, complex for, as a child. Um, I want it to be something that, that kids watch and it's like, this is interesting, I want to I wanna watch this, you know, there's, this is a cool story being told, there's, there's crazy things happening, I like these characters, I like the story that's being told. Um, there's no reason that, um, you know, all shows have to be absurd and not, not a reason that all, all things directed at children has to be kind of safely padded and, and you know, carefully handed to them with oven mitts. Um, things can be serious and funny and, um, um, and if, if um, you were to look at something like, um, you know, a lot of kids' movies like Kung Fu Panda, I cried during Kung Fu Panda too. Uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, really, it's really complicated storytelling and it's, it's a kids' movie, but I mean, you got this crazy peacock murdering, you know, pandas in the valley and, spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> You know, th there's really serious subject matter that, that gets dealt uh, in kids' shows, and I don't think that kids are unprepared for it. I think kids are smart, and I think kids are really sensitive to these kinds of things, and I think kids are okay to watch these kinds of things. Um, scary and mature and serious does not mean inappropriate for kids, and I, think, um, and I think it's high time we start making content that starts pushing those envelopes and pushing those buttons and uh, start getting on that train. Thank you. Um, I've been doing some animation tests on the side. Would you like to see some? Yes. Yeah. One of them's an anime opening. <laughs> this is not the anime opening. <laughs> So a lot of really like fun little stuff. Um, has anyone seen Insidious? I am a huge fan of James Wan, and a lot of his stuff is very influential to me. He's a horror director. He did the Saw movies. He did Insidious. He did The Conjuring. Fantastic movies. Terrifying. Um, this was me writing a letter of appreciation to him. That, that was Insidious, Death Note, and, and um, It in one, in, one clean, in one clean swoop. In four seconds. In four seconds, yeah, just, you know, mm, right there. Um, okay, here's the anime opening. <laughs> I 
I do not speak Japanese or know Japanese. And that was Google Translate writing us my profile. And I'm almost a thousand percent sure that was all nonsense on the screen just now. Um, and really, here's the kind of, uh, I say it says it's a super cut, but it's a whole bunch of stuff you guys already saw. Um, just a small trailer that with how things are currently in place and with um, designs and the names and stuff like that. Hypocrite, right here. <laughs> there is always room for a good fart joke if it's well timed and well put out. <laughs> and yeah, but so that those are some some fun things I've been uh, kind of hammering away at. Um, I totally closed something I was not supposed to. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the up and up on what things are, what's going on right now. Um, with uh, myself, with the project, now known as the Grim Repo Club, <laughs> starring Sonny and Bentley, and all your favorites. <laughs> and yeah, um, it's been a really great process, and I think um, I'm going to do a bit of talk about StarTune, actually. And um, I think what StarTune presented, it presents is something that, um, as opposed if you're looking for a an example of something similar that's happened in the past, I would compare it to kind of the Cartoo Cartoon Institute, headed up by Craig McCracken and Rob Renzetti for Cartoon Network some time ago. And that was kind of an open call for pitches um, into Cartoon Network. It was all done within Cartoon Network, so it didn't quite have the scope of what StarTune is, which is all of Canada. But um, that was kind of something that, um, where you submitted a pitch, and you pitched it to them, and they'd be like, if they're like, I like it, sure. And then um, they would, you know, develop it and work it out into a pilot, and that pilot would get tested and it would see how would they progress from there. And that's actually how we got the regular show. Um, yeah, so it, it's crazy. Like, I think that's the way I chose to look at it, and um, I thought it was a really great opportunity because, again, it's not a matter of pitch to us and say goodbye to what you pitched to us because it's ours now. Um, that's totally not what the situation is. It's much more pitched to us because we need good ideas because we want to show that Canada has great creators and can generate content that can compete with studios out in Burbank, that can compete with studios out in France, that can compete with studios out of Japan. Um, and probably treat our workers better. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that, that was ultimately what I came out of starting thinking. And so I, from going into it being overly cautious and overly, you know, ooh, I don't know, to coming out of it a winner with an idea that's now being developed a lot like the TV shows that I grew up watching, a lot like the TV shows that I watch now that I love. Um, you know, I, I'm a believer kind of thing. This is a really great opportunity for creative individuals. And it's a really great opportunity to put the artist in the driver's seat because I know as artists, there's a ton of stories we want to tell. There's a ton of stuff that we want to do. And this is kind of giving us the platform to do it. It allows you to put your idea and get it in front of broadcasters. It allows you to get your idea out there and in front of the right people. And I think that's a pretty, that's a pretty great thing to, uh, to start up. So yeah, that's, that's basically my experience with StarTune has been um, really great. I've learned so much throughout it. I've come out of it a stronger um, artist. I've come out of it prepared to really step into the shoes of a showrunner. And as a showrunner in a creator-driven show, you know, it, it's, it's pretty hectic. Um, creator-driven shows, um, how they work is basically you are the captain of a ship and you have to make sure that every individual department of that ship is being run to order and that order being your own. 
So you know, you go around, you attend story meetings, you attend design meetings, you attend pitches, people pitch to you. You know, you argue with networks and broadcasting and standards and practices. You, you, you do a whole bunch of, of fun stuff that sounds like a bureaucratic thing right now, but it's really not. It's, um, you know, it's not just all attending meetings and signing off on things. You know, you're really making sure that your vision for the series is made to your vision. You make sure that um, things progress on a natural slope or ascend at a natural slope. Slope, slope, yeah, I guess. Slope just sounds descending. I, I wanted to rise up. Um, so you make sure that, that things are progressing in order. You make sure that things are on track. And it's a lot of work, I'm not going to lie. Um, I have to put a lot of work into um, getting those challenges done. I'm not going to beat around the bush with that. What you're signing on to do is pretty much take on the role of showrunner throughout this process because you're going to have to organize voices. Um, I just did my own voices, by the way. You can totally do it. Um, <laughs> you have to organize stuff like voices. You have to find assets that you have to reuse. Um, for my challenges, I built Sonny and Bentley puppets in Flash and reused the heck out of them. Um, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Um, I think towards the latter end, when I started biting off a whole lot, you caught a couple tweens in there, maybe. but. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to make believers out of the people that were watching it so that they believed in the project and they got on board with that. And I think if you have ideas out there that you want to make people believers of those ideas, then StarTune is a really great avenue for you to take a shot at. Because again, they don't own anything. All they do is kind of give you a platform and a microphone so that you can say, hey, look at my idea. And it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, do you guys have any questions about anything like the process or, uh, yep? Just um, curious, it's, uh, looking through the evolution of your design, it's yep. really fascinating to see how characters will evolve over time. How much uh, do you think uh, the role of technology played in the choices you made as far as uh, evolving those characters into what they are now? I find that technology was both an advantage and a disadvantage. Um, if you look at some of the designs that, oh, Lordy, I closed the window. Uh, just scrolling inside, you'll be able to see the, 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 uh, click on Sentinel V, you should be able to get right in there. Oh, perfect. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, um, if you start to notice, there is a bit of a hiccup in progression from uh, the second one in the row to the third one there. That was because using Photoshop, I was allowed to trace and kind of have um, documents open below it. And so I would kind of get hung up on some certain design aspects that I thought like, oh, I want to keep that. And then it would kind of drive me in a circle. But at the same time, it allowed me to get content much more polished and out quicker. And, um, and I mean, like I still got to keep Sonny's weird head shape more or less in the final design. All I had to do was kind of rebuild everything else around it. You can still see, like, there's the integrity of the characters are still there. It's just when I step back and I thought, well, if we'll turn off the trace function on Photoshop and then rebuild it from ground zero, uh, from ground up, and then you know, it, it allowed again, it allowed me to produce work much quicker. Um, and that that went certainly was an advantage during the challenges when these things had to be belted out, you know, every two or three weeks after work and on the weekends. So um, being proficient in programs like Toon Boom or Flash is definitely an advantage to pitching because it allows you to kind of, um, allows you a sort of mastery over your time better. Um, yeah, does that answer your question or? Cool. You had a question? package you have to deliver two scripts. Are you writing those? I am writing one script and we are currently courting several writers to write the other script. Um, basically how this whole process went was that as far as my experience with seeing pilots of shows that I really like, the creator and the showrunner is always the writer and the director of the pilot. And so, uh, and of course, I mean, if I had an, if I have an opportunity to write a pilot, I'm, I'm going to jump on that horse pretty hard. Um, so it, it took a lot of kind of, I wouldn't say arguing, but a lot of telling them, you know, I want to write this. And they, again, they weren't saying I couldn't write it. They were just suggesting maybe it would be good to get another writer because we don't know what your workload is. So um, I am writing the animatic pilot that we're going to be um, coming up with a script for. 
I'm also very interested in the boarding process or uh, on storyboard driven shows. So I think it's advantageous to have me as the writer and the story because I am st I'm also storyboarding the animatics. So as the writer and the storyboard artist, I'm able to just shift things around that much easier. And, and um, Wild Seed is actually helping me find uh, some writers to kind of test out for um, the second script that we're writing. So it's kind of going to be, we have a whole bunch of production material that goes over characters and setups in the world. And we're going to give them, we're going to kind of, um, we give the writers a bit of um, some of those documents. So they kind of, they flip through it, they get a feel for the characters, they take a look at some of the challenge videos that I've done, take a look at some of the design work that I've done, and then they sort of, um, they um, audition in a way for it. So they'll write kind of a little blurb or a little um, summary of an episode. And if we like it, we start talking to them and we get them signed on to write the script. And yeah, that's, that's basically how it's going. And I believe the two writers they're currently looking at are a team of writers, one who's in Toronto and the other one who works in Los Angeles. I don't know how that partnership works, but apparently they're really great. They've worked on Counterfeit Cat, which is a pretty, pretty well-written show in my opinion. So I think, it's, uh, I think it'll work out pretty well in the end. But um, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about how, how you use music, like where you were getting it from and how, yes. how it affects the storytelling? <laughs> Okay, so um, a lot of the music that I found was from a, I, there were many a nights where I was on Google, Googling royalty-free music. <laughs> <laughs> and um, some of it, there, there is royalty-free music. Um, a lot of it sounds like bad elevator music, not even like good elevator music, <laughs> but. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to find a composer in Japan who has a royalty-free SoundCloud account, and uh, I give her credit in each video. Um, and I use, um, I go through the tracks. Uh, they aren't all amazing, but some of them are really good. All the music provided in here was either from Kevin McLeod at Incompetech, which is another really great source for royalty-free music, or copyright-free music. Um, I tend to confuse those two terms with each other often, but um, Kevin McLeod is a really great composer for quote unquote free music to use on your projects. And um, the other composer I found was a person named Perry Tune from Japan, who composes, um, as far as I know, royalty free music for <laughs> usage in videos. It hasn't been flagged by YouTube. It hasn't been flagged by YouTube. No one's shown up to my house trying to arrest me. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's been good so far. Um, and yeah, and, and basically, um, I always try to find music. Uh, I'm trained as a piano player, um, and um, so music is always kind of being almost not quite secondhand to me, but I, I kind of have, a, I have an ear for it. Um, and so I always want to find music that kind of reflects or enhances the situation of the story that I want to tell. So, um, and it doesn't always have to be, you know, music music with instruments. It can be atmospheric music or atmospheric sound effects in a way, just so that it isn't completely silent. Like you've just kind of like suffered a concussion or something and there's like maybe that hum even in it. I think, it, I think uh, audio greatly enhances um, a project. So is that more or less what you're looking for? Yeah. Okay, cool, sweet. I think we have time for what, two more questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, for your designs, like, yep. how do you process like, like deal with color? How do I deal with color? Background and character. Trial and error. <laughs> um, I, d I mostly try to, to deal with complementary colors and um, kind of um, color patterns and stuff like that. Um, the, the, the colors are a little washed out because of the, the brightness, but it's um you know uh, it's it's always something that's kind of like I, I'm not a great color artist but um, so I know but I know what kind of sticks out and what looks a little ugly or muddled so I try to balance that out and when I um, again another advantage to working digitally is being able to see that much easier and much faster whether or not something works or something doesn't work and that doesn't necessarily apply just to color but it applies to design and uh, backgrounds and how characters read on backgrounds and stuff like that. Most of the time, most of all though, I have to make sure that the characters uh, read over the backgrounds. 
So a lot of that is solved in the storyboarding process so that the composition is set up nicely so that uh, the characters are able to be registered and, and uh, can be seen over the uh, background. Is that an OK answer for you? Or? Yeah. Oh, sweet. Uh, any other questions? Is anyone interested? Uh, yeah? Um, I got I have a little bit of an inside track. But, um, I'm, I'm curious to know that initial phase. And you said you walked away and you wrote this 30-page Bible. <laughs> um, and, and, and there, I, I, I mean, there was, I'd like you to talk, if you can, if you can explain to us, there was an initial shift in approach. Yes. Um, you, you did a lot of world building and a yep. lot of uh, premise building. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a really good point to bring up. Uh, so when I came up with the initial pitch, um, uh, and, and by the initial pitch I mean after StarTune, um, it was kind of like Sonny and Bentley are part of this organization called Grimp Repo, and they're kind of like a government organization that investigates paranormal occurrences across the world, kind of thing. And um, and you know I had a whole bunch of funny characters, and like there are a whole bunch of spoofs of X Files characters and stuff like that. And then um, again I I built a Bible around that, around that idea, and around that world. And um, I you know, proudly handed it over to Wild Seed, and I was like, OK, guys, let's do this. And they were kind of like, OK, it's, it's OK, it's good, you know, but. Um, and they started suggesting a whole bunch of things. And they brought up the point that with the government organization angle, it almost takes away the emphasis on Sonny and Bentley as the characters. And it became more about what they were doing, and it became more about the job. And I was like. Oh wow, you're right. And so I suggested, well, what if it? What if we dial it back so it's just Sonny and Bentley? It's kind of this organization they've done, and we angle it more like the Goonies or the Losers Club from It, or the kids from Stranger Things. And they're like, okay, yeah. And that's kind of how that was the the biggest shift in the series since um, Wild Seed started helping me develop it. And um, a lot of the story, a lot of the overarching story that I wrote in that initial Bible to them, bits and pieces of it are still included in the current version of Grim Repo that we're developing, the Grim Repo Club that we're developing. And um, so it's not like uh, everything, excuse me, it's not like everything has shifted entirely and nothing remains of that ill-conceived Bible that I submitted to them. <laughs> I styled it like a D and D manual and everything. Like, uh, <laughs> Someday you'll sell it online. Is someday, you know, my Google try my Google Drive will get hacked and that'll end up some floating around for everyone to pirate and make fun of me for. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is there anyone interested? Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, or, yeah. I think it was. It was. Um, I think what, the the impression I got was that it was um, taking all that premise. And, and stripping it away to get what really counted, and what really counted was the two characters. Yeah, it, it was a lot like, it was like, you know, you guys know like Tootsie Pops? Are you like, how many licks does it take to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop? It was a lot like that, um, except no one was licking anything because that's unsanitary. Um, so it, it was a lot of trimming the fat. Um, so there's a whole lot, um, it was kind of like, Man, I'm gonna use a silly example again. Have you ever gone to like a shawarma place and they have that huge rack of meat in the back and they keep shaving meat off of it progressively? It's a lot like that. And so um, eventually we, um, we were able to carve uh, a masterpiece. No. <laughs> we, were able, we were able to carve uh, a really uh, solid premise out of meat. <laughs> And, and it was and it was really good, and I think um, and I think Grim Repo in its current state, where it's kind of you know um, Sonny and Bentley as kids getting into trouble and unleashing a paranormal apocalypse upon their town, I think it's a whole lot more interesting than you know Sonny and Bentley being sent out every week to capture another paranormal bad guy. By the way, do you guys want to hear like the running premise for Grim Repo now, like what it's like? Okay, so. Um, Basically, Sonny and Bentley live in this sleepy town called Bard's Cove, and they are paranormal enthusiasts. They vlog about it, um, and they cover all their kind of ill-conceived ghost hunting ventures, and they never capture any evidence, but you know, it's their baby kind of thing. They're best pals, they're inseparable from one another, and it starts out with them in a position of they are at rock bottom. They are kind of losers. 
you know, their most successful video that they've put out is one where Sunny, and this is all in like night vision, it's kind of like those ghost hunting shows. <laughs> so, you know, their most successful video is a, vi is a video where, you know, Sunny gets startled by a pigeon and it poops on him and he screams. <laughs> and, um, and so they don't really have, um, they want to find proof of the paranormal because it's like this town is so normal that something weird has to be going on. And eventually through various um, kind of things, things happen which leads them to discovering a map, which leads them further to discovering these kind of forgotten catacombs beneath their town. And there is a skeleton holding a glowing box. And they approach it and through their own decision making, they open the box and basically unleash a paranormal apocalypse into their town. And from that point on, the most normal town in the world becomes the most haunted town in the world. But just like those small town mentalities, no one really believes it, you know, so it's like, oh, that's CGI or something. And it's like, you can see the wires and like, and so a lot of the episodes, and a lot of the, and, and by the way, the, the glowing thing they, also, they drop that releases the paranormal apocalypse is a camera. And so the series, as the series progresses, it's not a matter of kind of what are they going to do next to capture the ghost kind of thing like what's their next mission it's much more how their lives collide with this paranormal thing that they've unleashed and so it can be like um and the way it works is that they capture ghosts using the camera i thought that was pretty neat <laughs> <laughs> so so an example of an episode could be like um here's one that i'm working on it's my weekend at bernie's episode <laughs> mashed up with Insidious. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like, um, the, s the setup of the story would be, Sonny and Bentley are in the arcade, which is where they hang out, and Sonny's crush comes over and they strike up a very awkward conversation. And he kind of awkwardly asks her to like, oh, you should meet up with us for frozen yogurt. <laughs> and she says, okay. And then she, says, she gives him a time and then that's it. And she leaves the arcade. And then the whole crux of the episode is Sonny being like, oh my god, I don't want to screw this up. And Bentley being, it's okay, I'll be your wingman kind of thing. And so what Bentley does is he goes digging around in his dad's basement and he finds a cassette tape and a book on guided meditation and astral projection. <laughs> of you know, kind of take, his dad went through a weird phase, you know. It's the 70s, people were doing things. Um, but he finds this book and cassette on guided meditation and astral projection. No, oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Um, and so uh, he brings it back and he says, you know, like, Sonny, you got to take the edge off. Here, I'm going to help you out. And he puts this cassette in and, you know, there's a very nice, gentle David Attenborough voice coming through. He's just like, you know, relax. I don't know if that's what David Attenborough sounds like. <laughs> uh, sounds more like David Bowie. But <laughs> just like, relax. I want you to think about your life and everything that's come to this moment. Um, and, um, you know, Bentley falls asleep, but Sonny astral projects and he leaves his body and he's like, oh, this is wicked. And he kind of like, or Sonny leaves his body and he floats away and he's kind of like, this is incredible. I can fly. And he's, you know, he's taken the edge off the situation that he was stressed about by flying around and exploring this. Bentley wakes up, finds Sonny's more or less dead body, <laughs> freaks out, <laughs> doesn't want him to ruin his date with his crush, <laughs> so he puts sunglasses on his unconscious body and drags him to the frozen yogurt place. <laughs> Sonny comes back, his body's gone, he panics, he turns around, he sees this hideous monster thing following him from a distance. There's a bit of it follows in this too. And then he, and then the whole episode has to come up, uh, comes to, Sonny has to get back to his body before Bentley screws up his date with his crush and before this hideous monster parasite thing gets him. And the story for Bentley the whole time is, Bentley has to convince Sonny's crush that Sonny is fully conscious and fully alive and not, you know, a disembodied spirit in a lifeless body. And that's kind of like, that's kind of like how the paranormal elements mash up with the character driven elements. So it's not a situation of, you know, they get a blip on their computer and it's, we have to go investigate this chupacabra. Um, it's more along the lines of what are they doing and how do we make their situation worse by adding the paranormal into it? Um, and I mean, episodes can certainly start off uh, a bit more story driven where it's kind of like they get a blip and they have to go investigate this, 
you know, this haunted house. But it's really the character decisions and the character choices within the scope of that story that make it a character-driven story. And I think that's also what makes it a funnier story. It makes it, it makes the audience think like, I like these guys, I like, I like Bentley's chops, you know? He, he, I like how he handles things. And yeah, I think, it's, I think it, it, it adds up to stronger storytelling and, um, and really, you know, uh, character-driven uh, comedy is, is, is the way to go, you know? Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah? 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 Cool. So, All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.